And off of that note, we are going to show you a video about uh, the commercial development prospects and potential related to the arena. In addition to the basketball arena, its parking structure, the live block, and the Bucks training facility, there is the potential for additional nearby commercial development. Much of that is expected to occur on the Park East Strip between North Old World 3rd and North 6th Streets. One of those first projects could be tied to the arena's parking structure. The Bucks owners and city officials are planning for the structure to, at some point, include street-level retail space along with apartments to make it a true mixed-use development. In the longer term, additional Park East blocks east of that project are envisioned as being developed for apartments, offices, and a supermarket. Also, the Bucks eventually will be demolishing the BMO Harris Bradley Center to create a site for more commercial development, perhaps including a hotel. The development agreement between the basketball team and the city require the demolition work to begin within one year after the Bucks take ownership of the new arena, which will be by the start of the 2018-2019 NBA season. Finally, there are smaller projects happening right now near the new arena site. Those include the conversion of a four-story former warehouse into Haymarket Lofts, a 72-unit affordable apartments development at the northeast corner of North 4th Street and West McKinley Avenue. Also, just across 4th Street from Haymarket Lofts, developers are converting the former National Ace Hardware Buildings into restaurant and office space. All of these developments will lay a foundation, but the question remains, will the new arena draw in other commercial projects? So Peter, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, you're building the arena. We built the BMO Harris Center. Nothing really happened as a result of the Bradley as, as a result of the Bradley Center. Now, granted, at the time the Bradley Center was built, we didn't have all this land to the north that was available for development. We had this ridiculous freeway spur that hardly anybody used. That's gone now. You have the land available, but I guess the trouble I have is wondering why a new Bucks Arena, as opposed to the old Bucks Arena, will necessarily stimulate additional development beyond what we already know is coming, which is your training center and the live block. This is only successful, which again is much different than what happened several decades ago. We need people to work and live here to make this successful and part of this phase, and you will see our development really focused on getting commercial tenants in this area, on, get, on promoting commercial tenants around the area to really populate, because that's the difference. The Bradley Center is built on an island. It's much different than kind of the concept here where the arena is a piece of the project and not the entire project. I'll can let I, Greg. Can I ask a question? Can I ask you a question? Sure. Are there any precedents, successful precedents that you're looking at as models? You mentioned Cleveland. Are there other arenas that have done kind of the thing that you're, you're talking about and that look to? Yeah, I think the best example, again, and there's some criticisms to it, but if you look at what happened to Columbus, Ohio, like if you take Columbus, Ohio in a microcosm, and if anybody's familiar with it, there was a penitentiary, you know, on the outskirts of the city. There was literally brown fields, exactly like the Park East. It was disconnected from downtown, and the arena, the nation, for the nation arena, literally got developed as like stage one, and started to spawn a development that included a lot of commercial, a lot of residential, a minor league ballpark, and really was just how to promote population growth. A lot of times we miss the point here with the development, and, and that is this, that the, the Bucks are building a new arena, uh, and the Bucks are, um, are helping pull together this 25 acres of land. The Bucks are developing the first private part of the development in the training center. But beyond that, it's really up to us and our community to really embrace this and make this happen. You know, this, we, we want to make this a neighborhood. This, this is not meant to be an entertainment district. This is meant to be a, co a cohesive neighborhood. It takes, a, it takes a plan, but it takes a number of things. If for, and and this, the start of that is it takes our community to come together. You know, the Third Ward is a neighborhood that we all talk about as being, you know, we're all proud of the Third Ward. Well, the third ward has those classic aspects that you need to have in any neighborhood. 
So what we want to create, again, with the help of everyone in the community, and this is where our time is. Our time is now to really make the difference, as Steve said, outside of this area of the arena. And quite frankly, that's really what's going to make the difference. The building is the building, and it's going to be great. It's going to be really great. But beyond that, the real transformation is going to happen in the 25 acres around this arena. So to support day-to-day -day living is, is important. To have human contact, things like that. To create a neighborhood, add the residential. We need to add daytime uses to this. We need to, we need to attract a corporate headquarters that could potentially come down to this area. But it really does start with our community to make that happen. Beyond, beyond the training center, the Bucks Training Center, which will be in the Parky Strip west of 6th Street and beyond the live block, which will be across 4th Street from the new arena, the parking structure that you're going to be starting to build, what, in June, right? Right. That's probably the first place where you're going to have any additional commercial development, correct? I mean, the, the idea is to have that correct. parking right. structure wrapped with apartments, yep. upper level, and presumably street level retail. At this point, can you tell us how soon you think that'll happen? I mean, I will tell you that we're in final RFP responses to residential developers who have put in terrific proposals for those 70 apartments, so however they Are want to Are these developers whose names rhyme with vandal? <laughs> there's multiple. There's, we, we were vandal. speaking yeah, of this I'm, earlier. That there's been a tremendous amount of interest, really, in, in we talked about this earlier at lunch, that a really a tremendous amount of interest for the land around, around the arena. And I think that's only going to get stronger. Absolutely. But, but you could perhaps understand some skepticism on the part of people here, here who look at the parkies and have seen very little happening there, particularly west of the river in the 10 plus years since the freeway come, right. came down and now wondering, okay, how much longer is it going to take for anything to actually happen there beyond the things you already know are going to happen? Yeah, I mean, Tom, I would answer that by saying the proof will be in the pudding, and we are aggressively We're gonna hold you looking to, to develop. No, you want to hold it to us. I think, I think some people don't understand what page we're on. Like, we are not planning to, to be half-baked on a development and a neighborhood and, and this whole development. This is a vision that takes multiple commercial plots, multiple residential plots. This takes creating population and we have an aggressive plan and and it's funny because listen you, you always are criticized but I will tell you phase one of this development is is 20 percent larger 30 percent larger than was even fathomed six months ago and I guarantee you it will accelerate even faster and, if we have this meeting six months from now and Peter to what extent will there be other firms involved I mean you made reference to your RFP for the parking structure requests or proposals to bring in potential developers to help you do that. To what extent will other developers make these things happen on the Park East? I think it's a good question and we're trying to figure out kind of what is the economic and investment strategy and partner strategy for these phases of the development and we haven't gotten there but I think what we do know is we will look to people who have developed, been done this before, done it very successfully and are encouraged and excited about doing it here. And do you cast that net wide enough to include smaller developers, including uh, minority business-owned enterprises, and absolutely. I guess I could name names. I'm uh, thinking of people like Kaylin Haywood and, and Lisa uh, Goins. Absolutely. I think like one of, the, one of these, when we look back, will be, this will be the most inclusive development project to date, and that's one of our goals. And, communicate, and we're getting better and better about the communication, we're getting better and better about the process, but we feel that's a deficiency in the city to really get, and it's one of our focuses to make sure that we have a diverse group bidding in and participating in projects. Okay. The other thing I'll mention is that, there, there, as, as Peter said, a lot of interest with local developers and small and large developers alike. There's also sort of a market happening. We're getting contacted from developers outside of, of Wisconsin who are looking at Milwaukee. And again, there's an inertia that happens, right? There's an arena, there's an excitement, activity, and it sort of brings additional interest to our city. So, all those things play a part in making this a neighborhood. But don't, don't get us wrong. It's going, to take, it's going to take time to make this the third ward. But does it become harder to do that? And, and to some extent, then, you're talking about activating from, from where the arena will be going to the neighborhoods to the north, predominantly African-American neighborhoods. Is it more difficult to do that when you shut down that block of 4th Street, to have that connectivity to those, to those adjacent neighborhoods? 
So I think the biggest deal here is like what we did not want to create is another moat in this city that separates and segregates. Well, I think it's very important, and Greg can tell you the numbers, of what the reality of 4th Street is in traffic currently. Like, but that's I mean, based on the present and not the future. I mean, if, you're tra if all this development happens, more people are going to want to use 4th Street, right? Well, there's yeah. a couple. Well, well there's a couple. Let's, talk, let's, talk, let's talk about Well, real just a couple of things. First of all, first of all we don't, uh, I certainly personally don't close streets, wouldn't, wouldn't agree to closing a street lightly whatsoever. And, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about closing 4th Street and if it's a good idea or not. It's not a good idea if it becomes a dead zone. I mean, would we all in this room agree with that? I think the Bucks would as well. In fact, they've, they've agreed to put it back if it, it becomes a dead zone. So, and that's part of the agreement. So the, the, no one wants it to be a dead zone, and uh, most of all, the Bucks. Um, having said that, the analysis, again, HNTB, who's the traffic engineer, they, they've done traffic engineering relative to how that would work with traffic, and it, it's, it's fine. Traffic would be diverted to 6th Street and 3rd Street. Um, and that, that all came out, came out well. But um, the, the live block, in order to make the live block and the arena a cohesive, as he said, sort of Milwaukee's living room, requires that that street be closed. However, the, the streetcar would go through this same plaza. The streetcar would still be able to go through. And that goes to the activation. Correct, right. correct. And, and you, see that, you see that in Europe quite a bit, where you have a a uh, multimodal or a streetcar that goes through a, a plaza, and that's, that's how this would work. Stephen, you've probably seen other communities that have done things similar to what we're going to do here, closing a block, just one block, mm -hmm. not like an entire pedestrian mall, four or five blocks. Have there been, uh, are there examples of that where it's been done successfully, and why has it worked? I mean, they mentioned Denver. Denver is a, is a very, it's, it's a very long, very uh, mature avenue, and it's not nearly as big. When I saw it, I said, it's very large. It's, it's, we have the same issue in uh, Boston City Hall where we have a huge public plaza and it's too big. Fourth of July is fantastic, but one time a year is not enough and it's really a windswept plaza. So it's, it's, it's more of a challenge. It's not that it can't be done, but when I saw it, I said, it's really big and the buildings next to it are really big. And uh, you know, how are you gonna use this space? I mean, you have a lot of, you have a lot of space. What, how, are you, how are you gonna make this work? I think that's kind of the question right now. One thing I will say is that uh, I just learned about some of the other design team. I mean, they have a really good team of, of experts. I mean, Gensler's a great architect, and the landscape architect you had mentioned. I mean, these are really internationally well-regarded architects and landscape architects, so I think everyone understands the issues. I think you have a really good team. I, I think that um, the Bucks, and it's apparent by your kind of embrace of things which are progressive and forward-thinking and trying to catalyze and not look backwards. I, I think that th there's, to me, a lot of really good sort of elements in place. I think you can probably do it. I think it's just more that I think the question should be always, you know, being put to you and, and, and challenging you yeah. to make it the best it can be. I mean, I think you know that. Yeah. It's, it's a very big space, and yeah. I, I can imagine, I can see it being a great place. And the scale would have to be broken down. Yeah. It's been done in Milwaukee, as an example, um, in the Third War, we did Catalano it. Square. Catalano Square was the yeah. same exact thing, but it's a smaller scale, so. I think the, the fact is that no one wants it to be a dead zone, and, and I'm, I'm actually pleased that the Bucks agreed to, um, in fact, I think I would have been against it had they not agreed to it, that if it doesn't work, it will be real. So the ultimate test of whether it's going to be a really activated space is when a group of people come up from Chicago and decide to have a pro-Chicago Bulls rally <laughs> right. on 4th right. Street between Juneau and Highland <laughs> right. without having <laughs> been beaten by Milwaukee Police Department uh, yeah. trenches. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they can pull that off. I think you've got a publicly activated space. Okay.